afterwards, because we'd like to get to know you and, uh, and just ask you some questions or not, whatever you're feel, feeling free with. But uh, our pastor is out of town today, had a, an emergency in the family, and so that's, that's why I'm before you today, and I hope you're okay with that, because uh, thankfully, <laughs> thankfully God can use anybody, even me. But I want to talk to you today about being ready to receive. Before we talk about that, I want to just open with prayer and say, Lord, uh, God, I just ask for grace this morning. God, I thank you that, uh, that you're aware of everything that's happening, that you have planned for everything that's going to happen. And Lord, and we welcome the Holy Spirit in to this place to uh, Anoint me as I speak. Anoint my tongue that I don't say anything that's out of your will. And I pray that you would uh, just anoint every heart to receive the implanted word and every ear to have grace upon my, my own lacking. Lord, we thank you for who you are and what you want to do today. We ask this in your name, Jesus. Amen. All right, so now that I'm covered in all the grace that I can get, uh, let's start. All right, so again, are you guys ready to receive the word this morning? Yeah. All right. Well, you said it, so you got to receive it. Now, you guys saw my, my wife, Jasper. Have you guys seen her before? She's the cute one on the announcements. No offense, Gary. But I want to open up <clears throat> with a, a thought. You see, I, I waited for a long time to get married. A lot of you that know me know that about me. I waited till like I was... 30 years old, which in my mind was a really long time because I, I waited with, with everything. I waited, shoot, my first kiss was on my wedding day. I waited for everything for 30 years. And in that waiting, you see, during that time, I wasn't always as romantic and charming as I am today. <laughs> but during that time, uh, I, I decided that I needed to make myself ready and that I needed to uh, to start learning how to, to clean and how to, to do laundry, how to, how to cook, how to do dishes, how to do, to do all of that. I was anticipating that one day I would need to be ready. And I wanted to be the most ready that I could be. <laughs> my wife, that was my wife. She was amening. Uh, I did the dishes last night. Thank you. Um, but... You see, I wanted to cultivate in myself and let others cultivate in me the things that I desired to grow. To be fruitful that would not only bless my wife, but bless all those around me. Because I believe that at the right time, God had something in store for me. And I want to take that thought that I believe at the right time, God has something in store for you. And I want to be, be ready to receive what that is. And I believe that being ready starts with specifically breaking up any hard ground or fallow ground in our lives so that we could be able and be ready to receive what God has for us. Is anybody tracking with me on that? Do you want to receive what God has for you today? Ooh, may, amen. Amen, preacher. I want to receive what God has for me today. You know, I was praying a couple weeks ago about a breakthrough. Has anybody been praying about that with me? I know our staff has. That we want to see a breakthrough individually. We want to see a breakthrough in our church. And I can imagine a, a time, this is what I'm praying for, that, that this whole area is filled with people. Not just for a number's sake, but people getting saved. People excited to know about Jesus. People getting discipled and people coming together to be a body, a church. And then not just this area, but all up in the balcony. And people waiting outside that maybe we'll have to start a second service. Because people are excited about God. So I'm praying for a breakthrough. And I'm praying to God, when is this going to happen? I'm praying to God, what could be holding us back? We've been asking, we've been dreaming, and I felt God say to me, Mitch, I want to do a new thing. I want to do a new thing, and I realized in that moment that that is what God does. That he likes to create 
new things. And so I can, I can look back on past experiences and things, but God is saying, you know, I want to do more than that. I want to do a new thing, and I want to use you. And that's just not me. That's you. Every single one of us here. I want to do a new thing. And so that is our focus today. What can we break up and be ready in our lives? Because God wants to use you in a way that you haven't been used before. Before I go any further, I just want to encourage you. You can amen me all you want. It, amen. It doesn't have to be quiet. Uh, just, just real quick. Is anybody excited again about knowing Jesus? Is anybody excited about being challenged to know Jesus more? Awesome. Well, again, you can amen me. Church, are we ready to receive the word this morning? In Revelation chapter 3, verses 7 and 8, you can follow me there as I tell the young adults to make sure that I'm not telling you heresy or something, that Jesus ate pancakes every day, or uh, you never know, so follow me along if you desire. Revelation chapter 3, 7 and 8. It says, And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia, right, he who is holy, who is true, who has the key of David, who opens And no one will shut. And who shuts and no one will open says this. I know your deeds. Behold, I have put before you an open door which no one can shut. And I want to stop right there. And I want to say, church, there is an open door before us. I believe that with all my heart. That there is an open door before us. And God is, is moving. We know this. God is, is moving. We know this. We've seen this. We've felt this. And the question is, What are we going to do about it? I'm going to pause right there. Just for a moment. What are we going to do about it? More specifically, what are you going to do about it? Are we ready to receive? Are we ready as have we been cultivated and plowed up the things that are hard in our life? Just take that thought to be plowed up, to be tilled up. I believe that God doesn't want just the the front few acres of your life. I think he wants the back 40. I think he wants that that little acre over here that has been hard and we've been looking at it and saying, I don't feel like giving that right now. Has anybody ever felt that way? I just don't want to do it. Or God, that's that's hard. Or or this is the best one. That one doesn't exist. That it's not there. That is no one knows about that. No one ever does. But an open door symbolizes a few things. And the first of which is opportunity. Specifically, opportunity for knowing God more. An open door symbolizes an opportunity for knowing God more. And that's the biggest thing. That's what we're asking for, what we're longing for. But it also symbolizes your influence being enlarged. That's at home, at work, at the store, at the gas station, wherever you're going. Your influence, your your area being expanded. Because bigger influence helps to evangelize. How many doors a day do we walk past? Ooh, amen. (laughs) But an open door before us helps to get closer to God and to evangelize. And I'll tell you... Why, in my, my opinion, it helps to uh, get closer to God, not only just for our desire, but every time I witness, that helps me get closer to God. Because I pray to God, I don't screw it up. <laughs> Has anybody been there? When you walk up to that person, you're thinking, God, like, I'm really kind of worried about this. Am I going to say the right thing? Are they going to reject me? And all this stuff. And so you get closer to God and you realize they're not rejecting me, they're rejecting God. Yeah, just do it. That's right. So the open door to the church in Philadelphia was written, get this, in spite of organized religion, God wants to open a door. And in spite of traditions or cultural norm, in spite of people not liking it, in spite of what's happened in your past or what's happened in the past, In spite of of all that, what we think should happen. I'll be the first to say, God rarely does what I think should happen. 
Is anybody with me on that? He likes for us to live by faith. He likes to stretch us. Woo! But in spite of all that, God is opening a door, and it's our job to push through it. Are we ready to draw into the nearness of God? Because that door is open. Have we allowed the hard parts of us to be broken up, the hidden parts? What could that be? That, that honestly might be offense. That might be pride. That might be some area of hurt in your life. And for a lot of us right now, God is bringing something up and he's saying, yeah, that right there, that popped into your mind, that's what I want to deal with. And he's saying, I want to break up that hard ground, that hard area in your life because I have plans for you. I have plans for, plans for that small acre or that back 40 that you have no idea. I want to plant things there that are going to feed thousands of people around you. And if you'll break up that hard ground, I want to use you. So how have we allowed ourselves to be cultivated, to receive the nearness of God? To send, uh, God is sending his spirit down like rain. Are we going to receive it? You know, I spent a few years down in Texas going to school and uh, a few years after that even too. And they'd have these uh, torrential rains. You guys might have seen it in some other places, but I just remember specifically, you'd see like a wall of rain. It'd be like a waterfall just pouring, and you're like, ah, that's, I'm about to get wet. Like, <laughs> and you just see it coming. But sometimes it'd be so dry and so hot that the rain would come and the ground was not ready to receive. And so we, we call those flash floods, where the rain pours out, and it, like a flash, floods away. And I don't want to be that person. I don't want to be that person. So we're asking God to move, and I believe he's saying that he's ready to. That he's opened the door and he has the key. Specifically in that verse we just read, it says that, that he has the key of David. And the, the key of David is authority. That Jesus has the authority to open any door and close any door that he wants. And so he's saying, look, I have opened this door. No one's going to shut it, but you've got to walk through it. You've got to walk through it. If you want to be close to God, you've got to walk through that door. And in Matthew 16, 19, it says, I will give you the keys of the kingdom. And we don't know what all those keys are. There's been a lot of messages on what they might be and, and things that they probably are by a lot uh, smarter people than I. But I know that the key of David is authority, and Jesus gives us that key. He's opened the door, and we can walk through it. And David was known for several different things. Prophet, priest, king, and, and many more. But I believe at the heart of David, he was known for two things above all else. First, he was a warrior. And second, he was a worshiper. He was a warrior and he was a worshiper. And I believe it's those two things that push through the door to God's spirit being poured out on individuals and on a group of believers. Because in Matthew eleven twelve 12, it says, The kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and the violent take it by force. The violent take it by force. We pursue God in a forceful way. We worship God not being worried about what we look like. We worship God pushing past any blockades to get to him. Pushing past everything. Like, Jasper and I have a, a little dog, and if I call his name, he will leap over couches, push past people, scratch car doors, <laughs> anything to get to me. And like that, I believe God is calling us, and you can insert your name. I'll insert mine, Mitch. Come here, I've opened the door. Come, come inside. I've got, I've got plans for you. I have everything that you need. I've provided for you. I've got shelter. I've got food. I've got water. And more than that, I have relationship. 
I want to have a relationship with you. So he's opened the door and we've got to push in. And we need to push in like David because he was a warrior and he was a worshiper. I love this thought, what David said. He said, I will become even more undignified than this. And church, get this. This is, this is hard to swallow. A dignified church is a dead church. Offenses will be taken in the lobby afterwards. Uh, But God's opening the door and we have to push in. In the book of Hosea, chapter 10, verse 11 through 13, it says this. Ephraim is a trained heifer, that's an ox, a trained ox that loves to thresh. But I will come over her fair neck with a yoke. I will harness Ephraim, Judah will plow, Judah will harrow for himself, sow with righteousness, reap in accordance with kindness, break up your fallow ground, for it is time to seek the Lord until he comes to rain righteousness on you. First off, church, I have fallow ground in my life. And I want to be humble enough to say that. I have fallow ground in my life that God is working on. And that's why I can say, I believe you probably do too. Areas in your life that you just haven't let go of. But God wants soft ground because he wants to move us forward. And I want to encourage you in that because he has a plan for you. He has all these things in store for you. Are you willing to break up the hard ground in your life? And I want to be first and say, I want to receive everything that God has for me. And just like I was uh, waiting to be married, I need to cultivate and let others cultivate in me, plow through some stuff, the hard parts. Am I willing to work on that? Am I willing? There were two jobs of an ox from our verse in Hosea 10, 11 through 13. And the first job was being yoked or attached to some other ox and plowing up hard ground. The second job in the life of an ox, the, the glory job, was to be inside of a threshing floor. And you basically walk around in a circle And you were tied to a pole without any other oxen. And you'd be just moving a big stone and it would break up seed and stuff to be used. And while you were doing this, you could dip down and eat. And it was pretty great in the life of an ox. You just ate and you walked. And just ate and walked some more. But God in this passage is saying this. That sometimes it is a lot easier to walk around in a circle by yourself and only receiving and not plowing through hard ground. And when you want to plow through hard ground, you don't do it by yourself. You yoke yourself with the rest of the body. You attach yourself and you begin to work. You begin to plow And you begin to grow strong together. And you begin to learn how to work together. And pretty soon, you're not just plowing through an acre on the side of your heart. You're plowing through the the 40 acres of Wasilla that need to be plowed open. There are three names mentioned in this passage. The first is Ephraim. and The name Ephraim means a double portion. And I believe God specifically said the name Ephraim. He said, Ephraim needs to come. I want to yoke up Ephraim. Because there are those of us here that have received a double portion. And that double portion needs now to be used. You've received the gift of the Spirit. So now you need to be used and yoke yourself to other people. And I believe even, even beyond that, that when you do, you will receive a double portion. So you can keep going. And you can keep plowing. 
And you can keep rejoicing that you are accomplishing what God has in store for you. The second name is Judah. And as many of us know, the name Judah means praise. And this is a simple point. Praise breaks up ground. Praise breaks up hard ground. Are we praising? Psalm 22, 3 says this, You are enthroned in the praises of your people. What that means is when we praise God, His presence is welcomed into a place. And I'm going to take a quick rabbit trail here and say that when I worship, me personally, I want to give God the biggest throne that I can possibly have. So that's why when we start worship, you don't have to ask me to start worshiping. That's where I start. I start with God. I'm going to give you the biggest throne possible. All my heart, all my mind, all my body, everything I have, everything that I am. I belong to you and all my praise is yours. And then the name Jacob. Jacob is a a name that they use for symbolizing all of Israel. Because God wants all the church. He's not calling just the pastor. He's not calling just the minister. He's not calling just the staff or the, the volunteers or the people that look good. He's calling all of us. All of us. You, you can say, me? Yes, you. Like, yes, you. I could put a sign up here with my finger saying, yes, you. And that means every single person. Church, God wants to use you. God wants to use you. He wants to use you in ways that you haven't been used before. Because you have value and you have purpose in God. I want to say this. It doesn't matter what age physically you are or spiritually. If you're a young Christian or just a young person, you probably have a lot of passion in your life. And you can influence people with your passion. And you should be influencing people with your passion. And if you're a middle-aged person or a, a kind of a, a middle-aged mature Christian, you have both passion and skill probably. And you should be driving the way. We shouldn't leave it to, to everybody else or anybody else. No matter what age I am, I want to be driving the way. And if you're an older person spiritually, an older person physically, you probably have a lot of wisdom to give. And we need that. We need you. We need you desperately because we've made some bad decisions. But if you're an older person, you should lead with so much passion that that tells me I want to be like you when I get to your age. I've seen a few people like that, and they have changed my life. So no matter what age you are, you're meant to be used by God. If you walk through the door. And if you plow up the hard ground. Verse 12 says to sow in righteousness. That's, uh, that's both the things that we do and the way that we are seen. If you're sowing in righteousness, if you look righteous on Sunday, that's awesome. But you better look righteous Monday through Saturday too. What we do matters. And that for some of us might be the hard ground we're looking at. The things that we say, maybe we need our mouths washed out a little bit. I remember when that happened to my sister. I love you, Mish. (laughs) But I believe God is saying it's time. It is time. And you can't hold on to the things you've held on to any longer. There are people around you that are meant to receive the gifts that you've been given. Because you have purpose. And then the verse says, it literally says, it is time to seek the Lord until he comes. And I love that. It doesn't even say to seek the Lord because he's come. It says to seek the Lord until he comes. And what is... What is better? What is more life-filled than that? What is more challenging than that? Exciting than that? Then just seek after God. And all these things will be added to you. Seek after God. How have we been doing that, church? 
in Peter's message to the world, really, in Acts 2.17, he quotes from Joel chapter 2, verse 28. And he says that God says, I will pour forth my spirit on all mankind. And that's really what we're asking for. That's what we're longing for. But I want us to take note in that passage that Peter and the group with Peter already had accomplished something that Joel was calling for. In the chapter 2 of Joel, Joel says, Consecrate a fast, proclaim a solemn assembly, gather the people, sanctify the congregation. Let the priests weep on behalf of the people between the porch, which is where they would teach and gather uh, to know about God, and the altar, which is where they would meet with God. Let the people be gathered there. And so Peter and 120 other people were gathered together waiting, asking, and pursuing God. And that's where we have to be. Seeking God until he comes. One of the great things is, I think there's probably more than 120 people right here. There's nothing stopping us from pursuing God until an outpouring of the Spirit takes place. The only thing that would be is if we haven't cultivated enough to receive it. Joel sums up this thought in verse 13 of chapter 2 when he says, Rend your hearts, not your garments. Rending your heart is a call for inward change that results in outward expression. It's the thought of beating my chest and saying, God, change me. Change me so that I can be like you, so that I can be closer to you, and so that I can affect the world around me because that is my goal. That is my desire. I was thinking the other day of all the things that I would like to have. And then the thought occurred to me, you know what I would rather do? Is I would rather uh, go on another mission trip. I would rather see more people saved. I could, I could buy this new really cool looking truck. Or I could maybe just give all my money in myself going somewhere and spreading the gospel. Where is your heart? Where is my heart? It's a call for true repentance and servanthood to actually be broken, tilled up, to be humble. To be humble is to know your strengths and your weaknesses and to let God work on both. Because in Matthew 5, 3, it says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Theirs is the open door. They have cultivated humility through complete repentance and are ready to plow up some hard ground. The open door is Christ working on you and in you so that you can be used to help others. And the greatest part of all of this, the culmination is where Peter says, and he's quoting from Joel again, I will pour forth my spirit on all mankind. Your sons and your daughters will, shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my bond slaves, both men and women, I will pour forth my spirit in those days. And this, this is it, church. This is what we're longing for. We're gathered together, not just to, to, to receive from God. That's just a benefit of coming to give to him. We're gathered together to pursue God until he comes. We're gathered together to be cultivated together, to yoke up and plow some hard ground so that when we're gathered together, the reign of the Holy Spirit will come and fill this place because we're ready to receive it. It is time. The door is open the promise is set. The key is had. Now we must advance, and we advance through surrendering to God. We advance through surrendering to God. And as the worship team comes up, the prayer team comes forward, man, I'm getting out of here early. 
Ooh, one amen. <laughs> that's okay. I'm okay with that. If that's you this morning, and you say that there is some fallow ground in my heart, some things that I need to let go of, then I want you to come and let go of it. Or maybe that's you and you say, I want to see this church reach the potential that God has for it. And I want to pray and seek God until he comes. And so I'm not, I'm not making what they call a cattle call, where if you're a Christian, you need to be at the altar. But I, what I am asking are for some intensely passionate people that want to see God move in ways that we haven't seen here yet and are willing to do hard work. So if that's you, and you want to yoke up with some other oxen, then come right now as Gary begins to play and break up some ground. Advance the church. So if that's you, come, come right now. Let's take a step of faith. If we all could just stand up, and we're going to go into worship. Spend a little more time just worshiping God. And let's advance the kingdom through our praise, through our worship, because praise breaks up ground too.